this is Mrs. Murphy and today we're going to discuss the internet. And we're going to discuss a little bit about the history of the internet, which is not in your book, but I think it's important to understand how it was formed because that will help you understand what it is. We'll also discuss how the internet works. The internet has its beginnings as a project for the Department of Defense, the Advanced Research Project Agency, or ARPANET for short. They wanted to create a computer network to communicate and share computer resources for military use. Well, they created four nodes for computer networks that could send and transfer messages. UCLA, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and believe it or not, University of Utah was part of this project. Now, ARPANET was set up with multiple lines to each computer, as you see, each computer can take multiple paths to get to its destination. Since it's the Department of Defense, they want to make sure that communication could still happen in case any of the lines were broken. By 1977, the path of ARPANET had taken off and definitely grown. The National Science Foundation wanted to promote advanced research education networking in the United States, and so they wanted to create their own computer network, not for military use, but for the colleges and universities. NSFNet was created to connect these universities, and these connections became what's part of what's called the backbone of the internet, or the major data routes that information travels on the internet. Now, since there's so many computers on the internet, there must be a way of finding the computer you're looking for. This is why we have IP addresses. Every device connected to the internet has a unique IP address, including computers, cell phones, servers, you name it, if it's connected to the internet, it's got an IP address. This IP address allows the computer to be identified. The IP address consists of four sets of numbers separated by dots. Each of the numbers have to be between 0 and 255, so 204-113-1204 could be an example of an IP address. 204-113-324 would be invalid. The problem with IP addresses is there's a limited number. They can definitely run out. IP version 6 was developed to prevent this from happening. Uh, this version has 8 blocks of numbers and each block 16 is 16 bits long. Usually the IP version 6 addresses are shown in hexadecimal for us humans who have difficulty reading 8 blocks of 16 bits. Not that reading hexadecimal numbers is that much easier, but it's definitely a lot shorter. Okay, so you have tons of different, tons of IP addresses out there, and suppose you have a large company. You have to manage all your IP addresses in your network, in your LAN, your WAN, whatever. Um, you have a limited amount of IP addresses, so you want to use them the best you can. Well, some IP addresses have to stay as the same IP address such as the web server of a company. The IP address is already mapped to that particular domain name, and, and so that way the domain always goes to that particular IP address. Therefore, that IP address has to stay the same. This is called a, a static IP address. Now, some IP addresses, they don't matter if they change or not such as a client computer, you don't really care what your IP address is, you just need something to connect. Well, so it doesn't matter which one you have. So instead of assigning every computer an IP address and trying to, to statically configure every computer in your computer network, there's a service called DHCP. As soon as your client machine logs on, then DHCP, the service, dynamically assigns you an IP address. Uh, so you may not have the same IP address from day to day, week to week. It's going to be always changing. The problem with IP addresses is they're difficult to remember. Even with IP version 4, it's difficult to remember all those numbers. Instead, we use domain names or web addresses, such as Google, instead of remembering 204-113-127. Just kidding, I really don't have Google's web address, IP address memorized. I'm just making numbers up. A URL uses that domain name to get specific information. The URL consists of a protocol, which on a web page is usually HTTP. I'm sure you've seen that before. The network name is weaver.edu. 
in this case, there's a folder called CS that contains the information about the computer science department here at Weber State. And then the page name is called facultyandstaff.html. There's many top-level domains listed in your book. A few of the most common that you'll find in the URL are .com for commercial, net, network, org is organization, gov is for government, edu is higher level education, and mil is military. So if you look at Google, google.com, the com is the top level domain. The top level domain can also be regional, you know, the two letter postal code for those of you who can still mail letters through the mail. Well, that postal code is also a regional domain in a, in a URL. Okay, so as humans, we use web addresses, but computers use IP addresses. So our domain name server, or DNS, that's kind of our go-between. It's a service that translates the website names into IP addresses and vice versa. Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, or TCP IP. It's a communication protocol suite that establishes rules for how information passes on the Internet. Now, when you listen to the radio in your car, you're listening to a signal. It's being broadcast out. Signal doesn't have to have a direction. It's just sent out. It doesn't have to any routes it has to follow. Everyone that's tuned into that station, station receives that same signal. They hear those same songs. The Internet is different, though. It has to be routed to the correct IP address. And unlike the radio broadcast, that data needs to know which direction to go. This is what TCP IP does. It uses the layers of the OSI model to route the information. Okay, so you remember back in the last chapter, we have those layers of the OSI model. Well, that still applies with TCP IP. If you're writing an email, if you're surfing the web, the application that you use interacts with the protocol. HTTP for surfing the web, FTP for transferring files on the internet. POP3, SMPTE, they're for email. I can never remember what SSH is, but the book mentions it, so it must be important. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, Linux and Unix. It's used to connect to a remote computer. The protocols at the transport layer include TCP and UDP. These protocols are both used to transfer data to, and ha have it arrive at the destination. Once the application layer gets the data from whatever programming you're using, it talks to the transport layer using ports. Each port's assigned a different protocol. Port 80 is the one for surfing the web, so therefore if you're using Chrome or Firefox, you're using port 80. This tells the transport layer so that TCP knows where the data is coming from. So you can see that TCP IP is actually just an application of the OSI model theory. It doesn't use every layer, but we have application protocols, transport protocols, network protocols, all working together so you can get your internet packets to their destination. Well, thanks for watching. We will see you in the next video.